Greetings everyone. This is our Q&A video for June 2023. Got a lot of really fantastic questions this month. Thank you so much if you are interested in submitting your own questions to have them answered here in our Q&A video. You can do that over on Patreon at all the tiers. Thank you so much for your support. Let's get into the answers. So uh, no particular order this month in the way the questions came in. Uh, some of these resulted in some conversations with people around the questions, helping to refine and figure out uh, what direction we wanted to go. So I'm really happy to be answering them. First was a really great question from Pip about FODMAP. And for folks who don't know, this is a way uh, of looking at the foods that tend to be the most uh, culprit in causing people allergic reactions or, or food-based sensitive reactions. And so when you're following a FODMAP diet, you're essentially cutting out the most notorious foods or sometimes lots of foods to eliminate them. It's an elimination diet from the diet to see how the body feels and then slowly reintroducing them uh, to see which ones cause you problems. And so the question around this was that Pip noticed that some of the herbs that we work with to heal or nourish the digestive system when there are all kinds of issues are also herbs that tend to show up on the FODMAP list of foods that you should avoid or eliminate because you know they have a higher uh, tendency to create sensitivities in people. And so uh, the question around that was, you know, how can we work with these herbs that are so healing to the gut if there's a chance that maybe those same herbs might be causing a little bit of aggravation to the, the system. So uh, a couple of notes that I wrote is we can't always take all the herbs and that's okay. You know, sometimes we have to find alternatives. We have to find herbs that will work for the individual. We have to look through the lens of energetic, temperamental, constitutional herbalism and see if we can't find maybe another herb that's got less volatile oil or less, um, you know, aggravating factors that has some of the same energetics as the herb that we want. That can always be uh, an option. And another is that, you know, we can always remember that we can work with the herbs without ingesting them. And I think that this is an important part of this particular answer that you know, if there's an herb that you think holds wisdom, holds information for you, for your healing, but that herb is one that you're a little hesitant to work with internally, don't. Uh, sit with them in the garden, make a sachet, you know, keep them in vases in your home, journey with them, do meditations with them, connect with them in a way that is not going to introduce their phytonutrients, their phytochemistry into your body, but that still allows you access to the wisdom of that plant and this requires us to flex our trust muscles a little bit right because we have to have some experience to know that the plants can affect a change within us even if we don't ingest them it's really interesting to me for folks that are interested in herb magic as much as they are interested in herb medicine how often we will convince ourselves that an herb can totally work magically without being ingested, you know, in a candle or an incense or a magical oil, but somehow we, you know, fall prey to this false uh, boundary that's been put up that separates what's magical and what's medicinal. And our brains are like, oh, but if it's a, a healing thing, no, we have to take the plant internally for it to work. So, um, it, you know, this is a good invitation for us to strengthen and deepen our work. Uh, and our awareness of what the plants actually uh, can do. And I, I should have also mentioned, you know, sometimes even the fragrance, you know, the essential oil, just the smelling of a plant can be enough to download and transmit that uh, wisdom. So very cool question. I like these because it shows that folks are thinking outside of the box. They're starting to think in terms of how we can allow the magic and the medicine of the plants to spill over into the fullness of our lives. And you know, uh, I'm always going to be very happy to have those kinds of discussions. So next up, a uh, question about trauma 
relating to plants themselves, right? So not so much working with plants to deal with trauma, which we've talked about in other classes and I'm happy to continue talking about because they are uh, fantastic allies when dealing with that, but traumas that maybe involve a plant or a plant might be a trigger whether it's the look or the scent or the taste or the name or we know whatever the case is um, for folks who are doing plant spirit work to have a plant occupy that space for us can be really challenging because it makes us feel like we can't connect in the way that we want to connect and it can feel really disempowering so i appreciate the person that asked this question um, i think that probably you're not alone and probably uh, other folks, you know, have had these experiences. So I think it's good for us to talk about it. So first off, honor your process. You know, uh, when this person asked the question, there was some hesitation about there being some closeness with the plant originally. And then the thing happened and, you know, and, and now the relationship is a little off. The plants are never going to be upset or take it personally or be offended or cut you off or whatever, if you need to step away and take a break. I've done it countless times for countless reasons, and I'm still here doing my thing. Uh, plant spirits are different than other spirits. And while we use the sorceress teachings of other traditions to fill in the holes of our plant spirit work sometimes, we have to remember that we're not dealing with goetic demons here. We're not dealing with uh, angelic forces or or deities gods and goddesses that sometimes when we establish a connection with them and then shirk it they get offended or they get mad right uh, this will not happen with the plants i've never seen it i've never heard of it they appreciate our devotion and our loyalty and us saying their names and talking about them to people um, and when we continue to do that through tough times i think they honor that sacrifice but if we need to take a break take a break uh totally fine totally healthy i encourage it uh, i've told people to take breaks before so first off honor your process um i like to also think about the possibility that sometimes some of these plants that were involved in or around or witness to whatever a traumatic event um sometimes can be holding on to a part of that for us not in the sense that they're keeping their thumb on our healing but that they are protecting uh, a part of the healing for us and the reason why there's some weird vibes is because there's an intuitive recognition that there's going to be some work that has to be done right that we're kind of stepping up to a precipice of of deep healing of shadow work and so sometimes those feelings uh, can be more about what's going to happen when the healing happens that unwinding than anything else so uh, be aware that even if we've had to distance ourselves or there's some weird feelings that the plants are still watching out for us they're still holding onto that sacred space they're holding space for us uh, and i think it's important to um, recognize that so um, trauma can be an ecstatic experience right where we step outside of ourselves and i think that plants above many other kind of allies can be protectors of that moment that they can kind of hold a link for us of reintegration of processing of moving through of finding power in uh, so that's that's important so honor your process take your time do what you need to do some things that I kind of meditated on and thought about uh, with this question is that you can always, you know, think about the name of a plant or draw them or smell them or burn them instead of approaching them as they grow, if that's where the trigger is, or if it's the name of the plant, you know, do everything else but or find a folk name that doesn't feel triggering. Uh, there are always some creative workarounds, but only when it's time, right? When it's time, it's time. Um, an interesting personal story that I will share because I think that the only reason that I can really speak to this particular question is that I have uh, a personal experience with this, which is that many years after uh, being gifted the 
plant spirit that I'm the closest with, which is juniper, um, and doing, you know, several, several years of deep work with that plant. And, and that relationship continues. It's still my go-to plant, my closest ally. Uh, I was shown in a journey that this same tree witnessed uh, something really rough that happened in my childhood. And I didn't believe it actually in the moment. I was like, oh, that's very weird. I think the, the juniper is just showing up in the meditation to be a protector for me, to help me find my way back. But in doing a little bit of recon, going uh, back to the particular space in the, the area where I grew up, I found out that it was in fact a stand of the same juniper that I work with uh, in that location. So very interesting. And it did put a different taste into the relationship for a minute. But I realized that so much of the work that I had been doing with that plant was actually about that plant having seen something, having been present for something, even though I wasn't aware of it, and helping me uh, move through that uh, again, totally unconsciously until a point when I guess it was fit for me to uh, have the realization. So uh, I don't think that my experience is exactly the same as the person who asked this question, but I think it's in the same chapter of the book, to, so to speak. So uh, hopefully some of these ideas are helpful. They're things I've played with and worked with and thought about. And uh, yeah, so thank you uh, for the vulnerability, for submitting that again. When people ask questions like this, it can feel big, right? And it is, it's a big thing to kind of put that stuff out there, but you always have the option to remain anonymous. And more importantly, when you ask those kinds of questions, I guarantee you, you're not the only person in the room who has them, right? And this is why I always encourage open flow, like stream of consciousness question asking, because if you have the question, if you have the experience, somebody out there has either had a similar or the same or knows somebody who has or will meet somebody who has. And by you uh, putting it out there and getting the conversation started, it just makes the healing easier for everybody, right? So there's gratitude there from, from all of us. Uh, let's see what's next. Let's talk about this is a really, really fantastic question. Uh, sometimes we talk about walking out into a space in a garden, a forest, and opening ourselves up, uh, becoming really squishy, right? Kind of listening for everywhere and seeing which plant in this space is calling out to me. Where should my attention go? Who should I sit with today? And oftentimes, this is definitely the case for me, definitely the case for some of you, uh, the flood of response is overwhelming. It's like, you know, everybody wants to hang out. Everybody wants the attention and it can be overwhelming. When we're doing deeper medicine work and it's not just who wants to sit with me and meditate today, but which plant should I be working with to heal something or to transform something? And instead of getting that like nice, clear answer from one ally, it's like, Kind of, we kind of hear everything all at once and we end up uh, right back where we started, right? So the question um, that Sharon asked, thanks Sharon, is about how do we sort of dial that in a little bit? Now, this is something that happens to me a lot. I think partly because of my years of practice and experience, I've uh, sort of gained the skill to walk into a space and be really aware of plant speak of that presence of practicing the presence of plant but it's not very helpful right if i'm just sitting soaking it all in it's great sitting in the the sort of um, orchestration of all of the feelings that all of the plants evoke in me but if i'm trying to have a conversation i can't talk to all 50 of them all at once it's easier to just do a little one-on-one -on -one. so here are some things that i have come up with first uh, I will be grateful that all of them responded, like acknowledge that that happened because it's very cool. And then I will say, this is too much for me. You know, honesty is always the best policy. Like just say, I, okay, now I'm just overwhelmed. There's too much going on at once. And I kind of take a couple breaths and I will usually close off some of my senses. So close my eyes, 
um, sometimes kind of fold my arms and just kind of draw in a little bit. And I will ask out loud that some kind of louder and generally more physical uh, communication will come from that plant. And then when I feel like my nervous system is settled and I've kind of come back to center, I'll open my eyes or sometimes I won't and I'll just use listening uh, and see where that is. So which plant gets a different contrast of light or which plant moves in the wind or which plant uh, has the bird land in the plant or bird fly out of the plant or bird chirp from the plant. I'm looking for something a little more uh, a little more aggressive, right? A little louder in, in the moment. Uh, and I think that that's totally fine uh, and generally works for me most of the time. There's always one. Sometimes I will do, you know, uh, a practice of, again, closing the eyes, closing my ears to the best of my ability, kind of just disconnecting from the sound of the space and just feeling um, from within where where that biggest pull is and then opening my eyes and saying, oh, it's that plant and go there. So again, uh, the sidebar of this question that's really cool is that we always want to show up all the way in this work and that's great, but we're allowed to have boundaries with the plants. Um, you know, the plants that we sometimes call invasive, like the invasive species are good teachers of how sometimes we just have to say no or not right now or not here right uh, it doesn't destroy the practice it doesn't cut you off it's not going again not going to offend them they're not gonna be like that that guy sucks we're not talking to him anymore if anything um the walled garden the symbol of the walled garden uh the teachings of the the goddess aphrodite right are respected by the plants that for the human person the spaces that we can have some control some order uh, that we can steward are the spaces where we feel the most comfortable the spaces that are more wild more chaotic more unknown are the spaces where generally we feel uncomfortable and also generally can be in danger right um, there are always bigger animals than us so uh, they respect the walled garden and sometimes in those moments where it just feels like too much, I kind of imagine building that little romantic cobblestone wall around me and saying, this is the space where I have some control, where I get to decide who grows here and who comes in here and who sits here. And everything outside of that is, you know, wild nature and that's fine. And sometimes we cross that wall back and forth and sometimes we stay inside of it. Uh, so try those techniques, see if they help. Um, there are some deeper things that I can share with you. So if that doesn't get you there, let me know and we'll do a part two of this uh, next month. Let's see. Um, really great question about fasting, uh, simplifying the life, the diet, the mind when we do plant spirit journeys. So for folks who don't know, every lunar cycle uh, over on our Patreon, we do a guided community plant spirit journey. It lasts 29, 30 days, one lunar cycle. We go from new moon to new moon. And during this time, we're really sitting deep with one plant and we're entering into a Gnostic relationship with that plant where that plant teaches us directly heart to heart. And we get a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge uh, and a lot of initiation from those plants. And the question uh, was, how do we sort of clean the chalkboard before we start that journey so that it's easier for that plant spirit to come in and write their notes, right? That's kind of how I think about it. And um, I'm hesitant in our plant spirit journey guides and in the meditations and the rituals and all that that we post every month for each plant to say too much about what people should do. And I really like to just give people inspiration and ideas and say, hey, play with all this, see what feels good to you. Um, so I don't talk too much about it, but I will say that especially for those first three days that we're sitting with a new plant ally or we're getting into some deeper work that the more space we can create, the better. This is why I have people build or dedicate a little spot as a plant spirit altar. It creates space in our lives. It's why we do meditation and, 
uh, sigil work and we learn the names that we can recite of the plants because it creates space for them. And similarly, we could easily think in terms of taking the louder stuff out of our lives for the first three days, the first nine days, the whole month, if you want, whatever works for you. Me, it's three days and they're not an easy three days because I like my loud food. Uh, so for you, that might be cutting out stimulating stuff like sugar and caffeine. It could be uh, cutting out you know, foods that leave a uh, taste on your palate for hours, things that really cloud your sense of taste so that when you sit with that plant in ritual, you can really fully taste them and fully smell them because they're teaching us through that, right? Uh, as folks who do these journeys know, maybe it's cutting out uh, a lot of TV or loud music or extra stimuli so that you are just as calm and centered and receptive as you can be. I think it's very personal. Um, there are definitely plant spirit traditions, traditions of plant sorcery, where different diets, different eliminations are part of how this work is done. And I respect that completely. Uh, it, they're not traditions that I myself could represent or teach, and it's not really the way that I practice, but um, we do have lots of lore around simplifying, fasting, quieting, insulating, um, hermiting, right? As a way to connect to the spirits that we try to ally ourselves to, plant spirit and otherwise, right? It's all in the lore. So uh, I think it's very cool to think about. And if you find that, uh, as happened to me the other night, because I wasn't thinking uh, very, very clearly, if I wasn't thinking ahead, um, that when I sat down, in the evening to do my sit with uh, Mentha Piperita, the mint spirit who we're sitting with right now. And I had brushed my teeth about 10 minutes before that because I was getting ready for bed, sitting with the plant and then go to bed. I realized that I could not taste the medicine over the, uh, the flavor and the scent of the toothpaste and the tooth powder left in my mouth. So a uh, gentle reminder, you know, sometimes we just have to create space. Uh, to really be there to really show up we have to turn everything else down so uh, however that makes sense for you try stuff play with stuff let me know what works how it changes your set i think it's uh, very cool and uh, the effort will of course be rewarded and appreciated let's see uh let's do one more we're at 23 minutes now let's uh let's do one more question so uh pip asked about plant spirit sigils. Uh, I had posted a couple pictures of the plant altar that I had dedicated to mint, the plant that we're sitting with this month. And there was a particular sigil in that photo. And a few people actually asked about it. Pip reached out and said, hey, let's, let's, let's hear about it. What you doing? So sigils, um, I actually picked this practice up from more ceremonial magic, but it's the idea that we can create a design or a pattern that acts as a shortcut to a connection with a spirit. It's like a calling card or a, a phone line of connection between us. And when the sigils are pop properly created and properly uh, attuned and opened, they can really support our work and our experience of the presence of plant spirits. For me personally, uh, when I work with the sigils and especially when I share them in our plant spirit journeys, they are sigils that have been received directly from that plant spirit by me in journey. So I uh, go and connect with the plant spirit and say, hey, a bunch of us are about to do some devotional work with you for the next lunar cycle. Uh, can you please give us a symbol that we can use to meditate on, to trace, to draw, to empower our spaces, and to act as kind of a little flag saying, hey, this is a spot that uh, is set aside for our work together. And then uh, ideally the plant gives me that or gives me the inspiration that I need to create it. And then I do a, an opening ritual on it and then I share it with everybody. So uh, sigils are, you know, they can, we can look at them as a signature we could look at them as an icon. They act as a quick link between our world and the green realm, between ourselves and the plant spirit. And one of the really cool things about the way we work sigils, specifically in plant spirit journeys, the way we do them, is that everybody 
doing the journey is all working the same sigil. So there it brings into a, a sense of community, uh, a sense of all of us kind of going into this together, showing this plant all of this uh, deserved devotion and really creating space between us greater than the sum of our parts for that plant spirit to just dump in a ton of wisdom, a ton of magic, a ton of medicine, and it really works. And for me to have uh, a symbol to ground out or anchor the work amidst the other physical uh, bits that I keep on my plant spirit altars, I find it's very helpful and uh, meditating on them, you know, visualizing them, tracing them, uh, using them to charge or empower items. Very, very cool. Uh, so I think that's all the questions we'll do this month. Again, we put out a question call on Patreon on the 20th of every month. You get to submit your questions and then your answers will show up either here in this video or uh, we will reply to you directly if it's deeper um, content. So if you are interested in doing that, there's a link down below. You can join us and until next month, peace and plenty. Thanks for all the great submissions this month, guys. See you soon.